Right. Anyone else inherit socks? That one was a new one for me. Um, welcome again to worship. I'm Pastor Lindsay Anderson Beck, as I said at the beginning, and we are wrapping up today our sermon series that we've been in over the past several weeks entitled Inheritance. Together, we have considered the many things that we have inherited. We've considered ways that we've inherited characteristics, um, maybe physical, but also uh, things that we're good at, skills, talents, gifts, things like that. We've considered uh, resources, possessions, money, things that we have inherited. We've considered the ways that we have inherited the promises of God. Remember, we talked about the covenants in the Bible We've talked about how we have inherited faith and how we are called to pass that on to the next generation. We've talked about inheriting wool socks a few weeks in a row, right? (laughs) You've seen that video. You probably have it memorized. You know, in the New Testament, followers of Jesus are referred to as heirs of the kingdom or heirs to the kingdom. This is our ultimate inheritance promises the scriptures. But what does it mean that we are heirs? And to what kingdom? What does it mean to be an heir to the kingdom? When I say the word heir, I wonder what comes to mind. And I'm not saying A-I-R, A-E-H-E-I-R. What comes to mind for you? Royalty, money, big rings, signet rings on fingers lots of property. When I uh, googled air, the top hits for me were pictures of the British monarchy. Maybe they know that I'm British, right? (laughs) They're showing me pictures of that royal line, those who are going to ascend to the throne at some point in England. The Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible defines the word air as one who inherits something or who is entitled to an inheritance, a future inheritance. You know, in the Old Testament, upon the death of a parent, the firstborn child was entitled to receive a double portion of the inheritance. The firstborn received the most, right? They were really the heir to their parents' inheritance. This privilege was called the birthright. When Jesus comes onto the scene in the New Testament, he is referred to in various places as the firstborn. He's referred to as the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, the firstborn over all creation, and even the firstborn from among the dead. And this language of the New Testament of firstborn is drawing on that Old Testament theme of birthright, naming Jesus as the heir the ultimate heir, the heir of the new resurrected creation, the heir on the throne of the kingdom of God, the heir on the throne of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, as the firstborn, as the one who receives this birthright, is now the one who reigns in the kingdom, the one who is making all things new. For the authors of the New Testament, this means that those of us who believe in and follow in Jesus' way are like his younger siblings. We're the younger siblings of Jesus Christ, and that means we get to receive a portion of his inheritance. Paul writes this to the church at Galatia in the book of Galatians chapter 3. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And listen to this, you are heirs according to the promise. Those of us who are in Christ Jesus, those of us who have submitted our lives to his lordship, to his priorities, those of us who call Jesus Christ our savior, we are now heirs of the kingdom of God, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We have a share in his inheritance, in his birthright. Are you with me? Yes. Clear as mud? 
Some people said yes. Don't worry, we're going to keep unpacking this. Look with me at the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. These are verses 3 through 5, and these are the words of the apostle Peter as he wrote them in a letter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In his letter, Peter cries out, He cries out in praise and in worship as he reflects on the new life offered to we who through Jesus Christ are now co-heirs of the kingdom. He says it's by God's great mercy. It's by God's great mercy that we have been given this gift, that we have been given this inheritance. And he calls the inheritance a living hope. He says it's imperishable, undefiled, unfading. It's kept safely in heaven for us where nothing of this earth can touch it. According to this passage, we have been offered a share in Jesus's inheritance, a share which we will ultimately cash in on at the last times, right? Peter is referring to that time when Jesus will return when heaven comes fully and finally to earth, as described in the book of Revelations in the 21st chapter, that time when the powers of evil will finally and ultimately be destroyed, when God's creation will be renewed and redeemed, and when there will be no more mourning and crying and death and pain. Those are the last times. That's when we will ultimately cash in on that inheritance promised to us in the scriptures through Jesus Christ. This is the incredible, beautiful, hopeful future for those of us who follow Jesus, for the heirs of the kingdom. But here's the interesting thing, at least to me. Peter describes our inheritance as a living hope. A living hope. That means something that is living is is breathing and moving and present and active in the here and the now. This is our living hope. What does that mean? That means that to be a co-heir of the kingdom with Christ means not only to have a guaranteed spot in heaven once we've died, phew, we can now just relax, right? We don't gotta we don't gotta do anything now. We can just wait for that moment. No, to be heirs to the kingdom is not merely to look forward to that future reality, to when we can have our pie in the sky when we die. Our inheritance of the kingdom is a living hope, something that's already begun. This is something that Jesus was so aware of, something that he constantly tried to communicate to people while he walked this earth. Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. The kingdom of God. Now, I know this language of kingdoms might feel a little weird or unfamiliar. It was very familiar to the early readers of the New Testament, those people who were living in the day of Caesar's absolute rule. But it's sometimes hard for us to access, right? Maybe especially for the Americans who rebelled against the British monarchy, The language of kingdoms can feel clunky and confusing and not something that we're very comfortable with. So I'm going to try and break it down a little bit. Did you know that each of us has our own kingdom? Did you know that you had a kingdom? Did you guys know you had a kingdom? No? Well, I'm going to tell you about it. It's our sphere of control. It's the place where our will is done, where we get to decide what happens. If you need some proof of this, I'll invite you guys to stretch out a hand into your neighbor's purse or wallet and take it. They're going to stop you in a heartbeat, right? That neighbor's purse or wallet is not part of your kingdom. It's part of their kingdom. That's their sphere of influence, not yours. And so God's kingdom, 
God's domain is the place where God's will, his perfect, his absolutely perfect and pure will is always done. That's what it means when we talk about the kingdom of God. That's the place where God reigns, where God's true and good and just reign is perfect. When Jesus announces that the kingdom of God is at hand, he's announcing the fulfillment of God's long-standing promise to eradicate corruption and death, to completely renew creation and forever establish a world rooted and grounded in love. That's the kingdom of God. That's God's way where love and goodness and justice and peace, all of those things embodied in the person of Jesus Christ, where those things reign. Every week in worship, we pray the prayer, um, the Lord's Prayer, right? We pray those words together. It's the prayer that Jesus taught his early followers when they asked him, how should we pray? And so every week in worship, we say these words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray those words, we are praying for God's goodness and justice and peace to reign on earth as it does in heaven. For heaven to come to earth, for God's kingdom to be at hand. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In my household as it is in heaven. In my workplace as it is in heaven. In Allentown as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray to see God's work of redemption. We pray to see God drawing the whole world into God's kingdom in the here and now, because it's not just a future hope, it's a living hope, right? As Peter calls it in the text that we just read. It's a present and an ongoing reality. The kingdom of God is always breaking into this kingdom, into our kingdoms. So what does it mean to be a co-heir of that kingdom, to be an heir of the kingdom of God, to have a share in that inheritance with Jesus Christ? It means that we are invited to participate. It means that we are invited to do something. We pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but not so that we can be excused from participating, so that we can lift it up to God and let God take care of it, but so that we can be a part of that answer to that prayer in our own spheres, in our own kingdoms, in our own domains, so that our kingdoms can actually come under the rule and reign of the true king of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of of God. We are to imitate, to tie our lives so closely to Jesus's that we are a part of the inbreaking of God's kingdom here on earth. And we are so aware that this earth needs that, right? I don't know about you, but I am feeling the weight of the brokenness of this kingdom, the kingdom of this world. Everywhere we look, there's pain and suffering and chaos. We try to do God's will, but we end up doing our own, hence why we have to confess every single week in worship. I feel that brokenness. I feel the weight of the reality that this world has not yet been fully renewed, that we are still waiting for the second coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And yet we are called to participate in the renewing of all things as co-heirs of the kingdom of God. This is our job. This is our holy task. This is our mission field in Allentown as it is in heaven. And we're not working alone. Scriptures tell us that we have the Holy Spirit as the deposit, the down payment of our inheritance. 
the Holy Spirit who is always working for God's good purposes in the world. We are called to actively participate in God's re reality, God's eternal reality, which is even now breaking into our world. We are called to partner with the Holy Spirit to contribute to the flourishing of this earth, of this kingdom, even until the day when Jesus returns and brings it all to its completion. John, the author of the book of Revelation, imagines us as heirs of the kingdom sitting on thrones, reigning with Jesus Christ. And one of the scenes that kept coming to my mind as I was thinking about this message and preparing for it comes from the movie version of a book by C.S. Lewis called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Has anyone read that? Anyone seen the movie? We're going to watch a short clip from the end of that movie. As you probably know, uh, the story is about four young British children who happen to stumble into this enchanted realm called Narnia, where it is always winter, but never Christmas. Never Christmas, because the white witch, the powers of evil, have prevented Christmas from ever coming, have prevented the seasons from ever turning. And this evil realm has taken control of Narnia. And so the story follows some dramatic twists and turns with these four children as they seek to rescue their brother who has been kidnapped by the white witch, and as they come to meet Aslan, this good lion, who ultimately will defeat the powers of the white witch by sacrificing his own life in exchange for Edmund's, in exchange for a sinful, lying little boy, as we see in the movie. And that's a poignant, poignant scene, and obviously has all of these echoes of the gospel story, right? Of Jesus sacrificing himself on behalf of sinful humanity. The story ends with a great battle in which all of the children play their part in helping Aslan to defeat the White Witch once and for all. And as the light dawns on a hopeful new day in Narnia, this is the scene that unfolds. To the glistening eastern sea, I give you Queen Lucy, the Valiant. To the great western wood, King Edmund, the just. To the radiant southern sun, Queen Susan, the gentle. And to the clear northern sky, I give you King Peter, the magnificent. Once a king or queen of Narnia, always a king or queen. May your wisdom grace us until the stars rain down from the heavens. Long live King Peter. Long live King Edmund. Long live King Susan. Long live King Lucy. Hey! I love this scene, and I love imagining all of your faces on those thrones. This is what it means that we are co-heirs with Christ, that we are invited to reign, that we are invited to play our part in bringing God's peaceful 
and just and good and loving kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. I want to end a little bit practically for us. What could that look like for you in the here and now? I'm thinking of us as we're heading into Thanksgiving this week. It's going to be lots of opportunities for us to demonstrate that we are living in a different kind of reality. Lots of opportunities to reinvest our inheritance as co-heirs of the kingdom of God with Jesus. I'm going to put a couple of ideas here up on the screen. If one of them resonates with you, maybe write it down. Take it with you. Hold on to it as a way of kind of focusing yourself in this upcoming week. Maybe you're called this week to forgive as you have been forgiven. Maybe that's a friend or a family member or a colleague. Maybe you're being called to love sacrificially perhaps to choose to serve the less fortunate in this season. As we look forward to Thanksgiving next week, maybe you're called to be a peacemaker in your family, in your community. Maybe you're called to exercise patience and empathy to assume the best of those around you. Maybe you're called to befriend the outcasts, the person on the margins at work or in our schools or in our community. Maybe you're called to care for the brokenhearted or to share what you have with those who have less. I love that in that clip that we just watched, each of the children receives a certain uh, attribute that's named of them by Aslan, right? What is the specific way that God is calling you to live out your reign here on earth. As heirs to the kingdom, in just a few moments, we are going to reinvest our inheritance in a really tangible, practical way as we give of our pledges and our offerings here on Dedication Sunday. We're going to sow into the good soil here at APC so that new life and growth and fruit can be born out and so that lives can be touched and changed by the good news of Jesus Christ so that more and more people can see that truly the kingdom of God is at hand. Friends, in Allentown as it is in heaven. Amen.